welcome to the print soft cover our online platform for the launch of select non fiction books the book we are going to talk about today is pulse to planet published by harper collins an important title that takes one on an exploratory journey from the details of a human body to the planetary determinants of the health and disease the book is authored by Dr. Srinath Reddy, one of India's best known public health experts, a cardiologist par excellence, formerly associated with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, epidemiologist and founder president of the Public Health Foundation of India, a Delhi headquartered not for profit that works to promote public health. A Padam Bhushan awardee, Dr. Reddy also serves as an adjunct professor of epidemiology at Harvard. Thank you for joining us, joining us, Dr. Reddy. Your first book, Make Health in India, came out in 2019, just before COVID pandemic. How did, how did the idea to write this new book that underlines the importance of individual health, but also make it clear that human health is closely linked with environment came about? I've always been aware that health has multiple determinants. Yeah. And quite often we are focused only on human biology and what happens inside the human body. Right. Of course, even within the human body, there are so many intricate interactions, but many of them are influenced by our surrounding environment, our physical environment, our social environment, our interactions with other human beings, and what is happening across the globe now. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take climate change or air pollution, or even the economic crisis, apart from the pandemic itself, we realize that we are not actually living in a bubble. We are being influenced by so many factors which operate around us and ultimately impact on our health. But quite often, we take a very siloed approach and try and find very linear solutions uh, which are piecemeal yeah. and they don't work or they're very incomplete or mm -hmm. inadequate. Unless people understand these interactions, we will not be able to really solve many of the problems that impact on our health. And that's why I felt it's very important that everybody understands these connections that take place within the body, as well as how they're influenced by all the factors around us. True. And then based on that understanding, as a collective society, we try and fix things and shape things in such a manner that health of populations is protected and promoted, and health of individuals is preserved or restored based on these actions. Yeah. I mean, we do require some very specific solutions, but we also require a broader societal approach. Without that, we will continue to face a number of health problems. So in a sense, when we look at the kind of health problems that are there, it's like viewing through a camera you sometimes will have to have the zoom function to try and identify the problem and to have a very clear cut solution at that particular point. But you also need the panorama view in order to understand what the whole scenario is like. Yeah. So this book is essentially an attempt to try and bring together those connections, talk about the interdependence that exists among people, among countries, and therefore, try and raise collective consciousness to address these problems before it's too late. Particularly since the world is facing so many complex challenges, which are affecting not only the present generation, but will impact the future generations. That's why I'm trying to get both the young and the old to get interested in finding solutions so that we can fix the planet before it's too late. Yeah. At multiple points in the book, you have stressed that how, how youth is a target, particularly for this book. Why do you say that and why do you think young people should particularly read this book? Firstly, they are the people who are going to be most affected. What we are doing in terms of climate, food systems and agriculture, of multiple pollutants in the environment, whether it is air, water or soil, and even the kind of social and economic systems that we are shaping now, including very partisan and polemic, pol polemical uh, politics that are divisive. All of these are going to be affecting the youth of the future. 
and unless they get engaged and try and mobilize society to fix these problems now, they are going to be the principal victims. So they can be very important agents for social change because they are not completely tethered to certain types of restraints that the adult population has because of professional commitments or because they are afraid that they may lose their jobs or they may have other kind of social benefits that will be deprived. So the adults in a sense are partly blinded by the immediate preoccupations and partly inhibited by the consequences of taking a bold action. Whereas the youth are not necessarily inhibited, theirs is a much broader world view and they see the importance of the whole global community acting together much more than some of the adults do. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, since they are going to be the principal victims of current actions which are going wrong and the principal beneficiaries of setting things right, it is for them to take charge. Yeah. And it, it is for the adults to help them too. It's not that adults should sit and you know, be quiet. The adults have a responsibility for fixing things, but the youth have a much greater stake in fixing the future. Yeah. The world saw a very catastrophic, devastating pandemic in the recent past and scientists say while this was a first one in a long time, this won't be the last one. How worrying is that prediction and how do you see that entire message coming from the scientists? It's very clear. If you look at the kind of outbreaks that have happened over the last 75 years, more than two-thirds of them have been zoonotic outbreaks. Yeah. That is animal to human transmission. True. That's not because animals have suddenly become malevolent towards human beings. Mm -hmm. It is because we have created conveyor belts whereby mac microbes, particularly pathogenic microbes, can spill over <coughs> from animal population, particularly from wildlife, where they have been hitherto confined, into captive veterinary populations and from there into human habitat and into human bodies. So we have created those conveyor belts and that's going to happen in the future too. Our deforestation mm -hmm. is releasing these viruses into animal and human populations. Mm -hmm. Our uh, travel, whether it is for trade or for pleasure or for whatever reason, uh, travel within countries and between countries, that has reached a level where it is easy uh, for pathogenic microbes to hitchhike their way mm -hmm. across populations with great ease. Uh, we know that even in COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, basically uh, celebrated with the crowds and, uh, and essentially traveled with people. So we know uh, that uh, pathogenic microbes will continue to be important uh, health challenges, whether they reach pandemic proportions or not, there will certainly be a lot of outbreaks and some of them will reach pandemic proportions if we do not control the rate at which we are causing deforestation, we are having unplanned urban expansion, our food and agriculture systems are also promoting a huge amount of livestock breeding uh, for meat consumption. All of these lay the path for pandemics. Yeah, very important message there, sir. Any message you would have for a country like India, which has a dual challenge of, uh, you know, access to problem in access to healthcare on one hand, and also rising pollution, other effects of climate change. What would you say to policymakers as well as people? We need to have a health system, which provides the needed health services right from disease prevention and health promotion to timely recognition of anything that's going wrong in terms of disease or even risk factors of disease like 
hypertension or diabetes and try and provide timely care in the most efficient and cost effective manner possible so that we do not have complications that will require costly care. And where required adequate rehabilitative and palliative services as well. So these services will have to be provided through a system of universal health coverage which attends to the health needs of everybody without imposing financial hardship. But that is still an incomplete solution. Yeah. We still need to address the social, economic, environmental and commercial determinants of health so that we protect and preserve health at the population level so that individuals are not affected yeah. by ill health. Yeah. So we need to bring all of these things together and one of the elements that we must focus on very strongly is primary health care. Because in primary health care, you can actually provide the maximum amount of health protection to people. At the same time, you can also bring about a greater cohesion among some of the environmental and social determinants that are acting at the community level. Mm -hmm. At the same time, at the macro level, policies will have to be set so that people can make and maintain healthy living choices across the life course without falling prey to addictions or being compelled to eat unhealthy foods only because they're less expensive than healthy foods that are more expensive. Yeah. You, in the book you have talked a lot about the ultra processed food and the harm it causes. Yes, I mean we must recognize whether it is tobacco or ultra processed foods. These are advertised addictions and marketed maladies. Yeah, absolutely. We need to really curb them. Yeah. Uh, because actually people in the industry, for example, say, oh, it's a matter of free choice. It's entirely for an individual to decide what to eat and what, mm -hmm. whether to smoke or not to smoke. It's not as simple as all that. Choice is either conscious based on the right or wrong information. It is conditioned by aggressive commercial marketing and promotion and peer pressure and it is very often constrained by economic factors. Even if you know that you have to have five helpings of fruit and vegetables a day, your pocket may not permit that. Healthy edible oils may be much, cost, much more costly than unhealthy edible oils. Yeah, true. Uh, so we have to make sure that the food and agriculture systems are basically uh, configured in a manner that they can support healthy nutrition for everybody across their entire life course without degrading the environment. Mm -hmm. See, the important thing is we need nutrition for our own growth and safety. At the same time, we need food systems which can provide that nutrition without harming the environment. True. So th uh, uh, that, that is an important element that we must recognize and act uh, if we want to safeguard health as well as uh, prevent climate change from advancing further. Yeah. Can I also take the opportunity to ask you about this generic versus branded drugs debate that started when NMC National Medical Commission came up with the regula uh, regulation that doctors should prescribe only generic medicine failing which they can be penalized. It was withdrawn later but there was a huge outcry by doctors. Well, in principle, generic drugs which are quality assured should be the way to go because they are far less expensive and that will reduce the costs of health care. And that's why when India switched from uh, product patenting to process patenting in 1971-72, mm -hmm. the Indian pharma industry took off in a big way and started producing generics not only for India but for the rest of the world. Now of course we have branded generics and unbranded generics. Yeah. But one of the requirements is that they need to be quality assured. The problem is not with the concept of prescribing generics by name. The problem lies in not having adequate regulatory systems where the quality of these drugs is not being appropriately assessed across the multiple producers. There are so many producers of drugs, including uh, I mean, uh, very small manufacturers where we are not sure of the quality. And we also know that state regulatory authorities 
are much weaker than the central regulatory yeah, authority. True, true. Even the central regulatory authority was very poorly staffed and it's only over the last one, one and a half decades that the central regulatory authorities have become stronger. Mm -hmm. But in number of states, the regulatory authorities are extremely weak. Yeah. Whether they are complicit or not is a different issue. But they are not even adequately staffed and lack the technical competence. So there is a challenge about quality. Therefore, I would say, in principle, generic drugs are the way to go. But we do need quality assurance. And till that quality assurance is in place, I do not think you can force any doctor to write only generic drugs. Yeah. Because they also owe a duty to their patients to protect them against uh, spurious drugs or ineffective drugs. Yeah, so first step should be fixing the quality, we have guaranteeing to. the quality. First absolutely, before. absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Reddy. And I hope the book does really well and is read by people across the age groups. I hope so too. Yeah. It is meant for everybody, though I believe it's the young who must take charge. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much.